Wow, so it's been like four months since uh, I got the x-axis done, and here's the y-axis. I'm not gonna lie, this probably took more than half the effort in total so far for the machine. It's been a real busy four months, and we got lots to go over, so let's get started. First thing I did is create some templates for all the three inch square stock, four inch square stock, and then also some three by six rectangular stock. This is so all the threaded bolt holes and then all the through holes for those bolts lined up on all the pieces. One of the first things I made were just the feet for the legs. Uh, these are just quarter inch hot rolled steel cut to size with some 3 8 inch uh, swiveling level feet. These are just then welded onto the bottom of the 4 inch rectangular tubing with a quarter inch wall. Pay no attention to my poor MIG welding skills, I don't have gas or anything running with it, just flex core wire. Here you can see the uh, 7 inch by 3 inch hot rolled steel used for the tabs to actually connect the legs to the main rails. Um, you should see on each side one hole for the 3 8 inch bolt that actually does most of the attaching. Then on each side of that, uh, above and below, there is a, a 10 24 threaded hole for set screws so that way we can level these legs later and then at the end I have some pilot holes uh, those are for um, some tapered pins later if I ever want to make this thing to where I can take it apart that way I can take the machine completely apart and all the parts will fit back together with these registration pins and at some point I realized there was going to be a lot of uh, tapping of all these bolt holes and so I got clever, I got like one of those, uh, what do they call it, tapping fixtures from Grizzly. And I thought, hey, why don't I just uh, weld on this socket to it and then I could attach it to my impact drill and just use that. It worked well, I mean, I didn't get the socket completely centered perfectly so it wobbled and that was kind of a danger. Um, but later, I ended up using this uh, ratcheting tap for all my bigger taps like 3 8 inch taps and stuff like that from a it's a, actually a piece from Harbor Freight it's actually not bad really well built after that I kind of pre-assembled everything to see what it would look like and kind of do like a sight level and everything make sure everything was lined up and that's when I realized you really want to make sure the metal yard you go to actually has their bandsaws and everything uh, squared up because yeah all these pieces were off drastically. I ended up having to recut them myself and I had this metal cut to size so it was kind of frustrating because I had already welded everything on there. I had to redo the whole thing and some of the legs ended up being shorter but it wasn't critical to the design if that happened so lesson learned. I got a lot of inspiration from this Madvac um, guy who built this giant CNC. It's all over cnczone.com and things like that. You can google it. Um, but anyway he used epoxy uh, between all the major metal to metal joints that way there's like a hundred percent surface area contact um, because otherwise you know you're only getting like 20 percent he said I tried it I used these set screws and I used a Harbor Freight level to try to level the legs to the beams I'd calibrate the level onto the beam and then I'd slap it against the leg and get it trying to working I probably would have done this totally different later I'll talk about it more and the general idea is that you uh, put mold release on one metal part and then you sand or etch the other metal part. I just sand it, I didn't want to mess with muriatic acid or anything like that. And that way the epoxy adheres to one part and comes off the other part pretty easily. I used, uh, like Madvac, I used two different kinds of releases. I used this uh, Meguiar's rubbing uh, release and also this uh, spray release I got off of Amazon. And I had to come up with a uh, way to dam up all the joints to actually pour the epoxy in. So I got this huge chunk of modeling clay that I used to dam up a lot of these joints so that I could pour the epoxy in. I also used it underneath like you know, washers and bolts so there wouldn't be leaks there either. I then used a whole lot of brown packing tape to kind of wall everything up and seal it in there. And you can kind of see here too, I used uh, that metal ducting tape to kind of reinforce it as well. And in uh, Madvac's uh, website, he talks about using fillers to strengthen the epoxy, and me thinking I'm clever is I can't get a hold of all the stuff he's doing, so I'll just use this uh, aluminum oxide, you know, for blasting. 
and uh, then I actually poured it in and let it harden on one of the legs and it just, yeah, it, it didn't do the trick. It was peeling off. And maybe there's like a vacuum process for mixing it or something, but you can see here it's super flexible. I mean, compared to just the straight up resin, which is, you know, incredibly hard and makes a nice pinging noise when you bang it against things. Then I just use syringes to actually inject the epoxy into where the pilot holes for the taper pins are. Um, you can kind of see here, yeah, the bolts, the set screws used for leveling the leg against the beam and just waiting until the resin actually started popping out on the other side. Then once all those legs were done on one side, I used that side to align the legs on the other one and also checked it for level and everything like that, trying to get it as close as possible. Again, I probably wouldn't do that this way. I would just assemble the whole machine and then adjust as I went, It'd be like tuning a piano. And I got a little frustrated at one point. Um, the Harbor Freight level, uh, you would turn it 180 degrees and it would read something else and I started not to really trust it. Um, unfortunately, after all the legs were set, I actually found a great deal on this level. Uh, Digipass DWL2000XY. And this thing is accurate down to 0 0.01 degrees compared to the Harbor Freight, which I think it was just 0 0.1. Plus, you could do two axes at a time, an X, Y, or you could set it up on the side. It automatically went to one axis. It was great. It was beautiful. Um, I didn't really get to use it for too long. It broke, like, the next day. I was so sad. Since I had gotten it used off of Amazon, um, I really couldn't get another one for that same price. It was the only one, so I had to send it back. So I ended up springing for this other DigiPass, the DWL80 Pro, and it's accurate down to 0.05. Uh, that's still twice as much as the Harbor Freight. And honestly, with the tools I'm using, that's probably about as accurate as I'm going to get anyways. And one thing this whole thing has taught me, if you have the choice between expensive tools and expensive measuring equipment, pick the measuring equipment. You can compensate for cheap tools, but you can't compensate for something like a caliper that gives you wrong readings every now and then. And here's one of the sides upright. And here's a zoom-in picture of what the epoxy looks like after everything's stripped away from it. After I braced them into position with some adjustable stands that I got that probably weren't designed for it, I ratcheted it up with some tie-downs, the cross beams into place by using some uh, scrap U-channel uh, above them. I then clamped some scrap metal to each corner. That way I could try to measure diagonally to see if everything is square. Also measure you know, side to side as well. After all that was in place, um, I realized things weren't as rigid as they could be, so I welded on these uh, extra lateral feet to the legs with some more uh, leveling feet. That firmed things up quite a bit, but it really wasn't where it needed to be until I added these uh, gusset type pieces to the cross members. Here you can kind of see everything put together without all the uh, extra supports. And now is the part where I probably should have done all the epoxying, or at least after when I put all the other uh, minor supports in. Here you can see I've used these wells instead of the other uh, pilot holes to just kind of like, you inject it in, let it fill, inject it in, let it fill until it levels up on one of the other sides, and then you know it's full. Looks kind of like bird baths. Then it was time to pour the actual rail beds. I used a slow hardening epoxy from US Composites. Too much surface area to try to do a fast one even though it would have been a harder bed. And I used foam board for the walls again like I did with the X-axis. Except this time I lined the inside of it with um, clear packing tape. It made separation and cleanup after the epoxy hardened so much easier. Now I use some cheapo aluminum angle to make a transfer channel between the two rails. That way the epoxy would flow between them and you know, self-level and they would be level with each other. In hindsight, um, I should have used more. I only used one, but I probably should have used two or three. It might have even gotten even more level. Then I just poured it in by hand, trying to get it as level as possible to begin with. Um, but I also poured some in the channel uh, just to make sure everything flowed. Was it capillary action? I don't know. Um, it came out alright. I used a heat gun to go around and get all the bubbles out. 
I then also started hitting it with a dead blow hammer just to shake it up and make sure it all self-leveled. I then let it set up for a day and it started looking like glass. So then I started taking off the supports and it looked like the silicone uh, caulk I had used didn't really fully harden. But that's okay, I had packing tape on the outside too to help seal it up. And it looked pretty good, um, except I did notice that uh, one side of the end of the rails was a lot thinner than the other side of the end of the rails, so it looks like things still weren't completely level, but you know, that's the point of the self-leveling epoxy anyways. And I didn't take a picture, but you can kind of make it out in this shot and subsequent shots, but there's also some uh, support channels going around the bottom sides and the bottom front and back of the whole machine now. Um, I was just adding them for even more support, make things even more rigid. Then just like the x-axis video I did, I ended up drilling, you know, tap holes for 6mm bolts every 60 millimeters um, into the cold rolled steel that's going to act as the railway and then the beam below it. I really need to think about investing in a mag drill. One cool thing I figured out is that Harbor Freight has these cool little um, tapping sets that are spiral based. And those made tapping these 6mm holes a breeze. Which is good because there's a lot of them. I still end up using the ratcheting tap for 5 16 and 3 8 but anything smaller than that I ended up using the spiral bits. They surprisingly didn't break. I cleaned up everything and then I loosely mounted the cold rolled steel railways that way when I actually get the gantry in place I just slide it back and forth until everything's lined up and rolling smooth and I go tighten all the bolts as I go that way everything's parallel then it was time to go back to the smaller machine and machine up all the linear motion parts for the y-axis the carriages are actually made out of a uh, six inch by three quarter inch aluminum bar that's about the biggest I could get in my area, so a lot of the designs for the rails and stuff are based on that constraint. I was also a little concerned about all the accumulated weight of the gantry on these carriages, so I made some center supports that are adjustable, um, had to machine away a little area at the bottom to clear the uh, bolts in the railway system. Also put a little slot in there that you can stick a screwdriver in to adjust the positioning. Here you can kind of see them test attached to the railways. And here you can see the geared motor systems I created just like for the x-axis. Next I wanted to try to find the center of gravity of the gantry. Um, that way when I mounted it to the carriage systems it wouldn't put too much pressure on one spot or the other. Or you know sway when it moved back and forth. Um, I did this by clamping it down to some uh, U-channel I had and then slid some aluminum bar underneath all that and tapped it around until the whole thing was kind of pretty well balanced on itself. Here you can kind of see the same swivel action that's on the x-axis. Um, I don't have the spring tensioner in here but if you go back to the other video you can see that it's the same thing. And here are all the uh, rack clamps that haven't been cut up yet and they're used to attach the racks to the side of the rails. Here you can see me with the X gantry clamped onto the carriages. But even after I bolted it down, um, there was still too much play if I tugged on one end or the other with the torque. It, went, it made the whole thing get a little off kilter. So I also welded up these um, more gusset type supports um, out of some uh, four inch angle and some half inch plate. That pretty much solved the problem. Here I am testing uh, the X and the Y axis manually. And here's a shot of the Y axis moving under its own power. And here's a shot of all three axes moving together under their own power. I was actually quite surprised how fast the system was even with just some basic tuning. I think that 5 to 1 gear ratio for the servos was just about right. Now in hindsight, there are a number of things I probably would have done differently if I had to do them all over again. And here I'll just give you some of my notes. One, I probably would have stuck closer to Madvax design of just two beefy legs and, you know, a couple triangulated supports going out to the ends. The only reason I did the four straight 
parallel legs was because of cost of material and I also want the legs to also act as a guide system for a hydraulic lift I want to build later. But yeah, I think it's a lot easier to level just four legs and not eight. Two, I probably would have waited until the whole thing was assembled before I started pouring the epoxy joints. Um, the only issue with that is that if you use a mold release, um, it can dry out by then and pretty much glue your parts together. But they're actually not too hard to break apart with the chisel, as I had to learn. Number three, I might have foregone the epoxy joints. Not the epoxy beds for the rails and stuff like that, but just, you know, the stuff I had to use to do the metal, the metal joints. In my instance, it probably worked out because um, a lot of my metal is not cut quite perfectly. I don't have, you know, the greatest tools. So it made the whole assembly thing a little more forgiving. Um, but if I did have access to the right tools and was a better, you know, at machining things, I probably would just do metal to metal. Number four, I would have probably come up with a side mount rail system instead of the top mount for the y-axis. Um, I already can tell that I'm going to need a pretty elaborate wiper you know, mechanism to keep debris from clogging up and ultimately stalling out the um, carriages for the y-axis. Number five, um, I probably would have gone with the roller bearings um, if I could do it all over again. The only reason I didn't was because they were expensive um, comparatively to skate bearings, but I ended up using more skate bearings, so that negated that point. The other thing is the rails uh, were kind of expensive, and the whole like grinding your own rail, I didn't really trust that like they do with the MechMate, um, but, you know, could work. I think uh, uh, CNC Rattle Parts now has like a new modular B-roller system that looks pretty nice. Um, and also with doing the multiple, uh, like four bearings on each side of the, you know, the cold rolled steel, it's almost impossible to get all four to touch exactly the same. Um, it's usually like two, three, lucky, and some places I can get four, but I think the V-rollers, um, less bearings is more, um, a lot more stable, especially if you can use those, what they call eccentric bearings, to adjust them as opposed to this system with the uh, set screws. It's a good system, uh, it was a great learning experience, but if I could do it again, I'd probably do feet rollers. And it might be a moot point because I actually plan on upgrading to uh, high wind, like linear rail systems, that's why I drilled everything at um, 60 millimeter intervals with six millimeter bolts. But the V's would have been easier an initial go and either which way I definitely would side mount the high winds and the V rollers number six um, lastly I would say jigs and by what I mean by jigs you know just temporary structures you create to help you line work up with um, in this case I would have budgeted for like a third more for metal so that way I could buy some extra like angle and uh, u-channel channel stuff so I could create positioning jigs that would help me gotten the um, all the rail systems and legs upright and straight and equal distance from each other um, use little set screws in the jigs to slowly position things I ended up going around like banging a lot of stuff with my uh, dead blow hammer trying to get into place and having to remeasure and remeasure so if I'd made jigs and if I was sure of my design and everything like that then I would have had repeatability I could have like you know built all these parts off-site, take it somewhere else, set it up again, you know, pretty easy. Um, next time I build a big machine like this, I'm going to make a lot of jigs. You know, that way, in case I ever wanted to build one of these for somebody else for fun and profit, I'd be able to put it together pretty concisely. And with great speed. So, there you have it. A year and a half later, and I've got the X-axis, the Y-axis, the Z-axis all going. I still have some work with uh, cable management systems, um, dust collection, and limit switches, um, homing switches. Um, I'm putting in a temporary bed right now, but eventually it would be nice to make a hydraulic bed that raises and lowers um, with different kind of Z-axis depth, because you know, swap out Z-axes for different types of work. 
Um, also, I wouldn't mind making a BA head or whatever they're called. <laughs> Make it a five axis machine, maybe eventually a six axis machine. Um, I'd sell for four right now. But anyway, um, for right now, it's enough to get me going. So I hope you guys dig it and uh, let me know if you have any questions later on.